in a short paragraph leading to a response, explain why the normal force determines the size of frictional force and not the weight. Well, friction depends on the surface roughness and how hard an object is pressed against that surface. If I slide a block along a table and then slide that block along the table but press down really hard, the pressed down block will experience more friction because it has a larger force normal, even though they have the same weight. So you can take two objects that have the same coefficient of friction. Take your calculator in front of you, slide it across your desk, then push the calculator really hard while you slide it across the desk. What you're going to find is there's more resistance to the slide because you've pushed down. The surfaces haven't changed, so the coefficient of friction hasn't changed. The weight of the calculator hasn't changed. You've only added a downward force. Because the vertical forces are balanced, when you added the downward force, force normal increased. And here we can see force normal is more important than the calculation where weight is not even a part of the calculation. Hopefully between the verbal explanation and what's written there will help you understand the, the importance of force normal over weight in the calculation of force friction. The next question, we have a 45 Newton, um, a force of 45 Newtons pulls an object at constant velocity. Constant velocity means balanced forces Net force is zero, acceleration zero, equilibrium. So if it's at constant velocity, at 45 to the right means there's 45 to the left. So the force of friction would also be 45. Will the force required to pull the object at a constant velocity of 10 be greater than, less than, or equal to? It's going to be equal to. Did force normal change? Did coefficient of friction change? No. So 45 to the left remains, and if you're at constant velocity, you're, you have balanced forces. You still have 45 newtons to the left, so you'll need 45 newtons to the right. Now to explain this, I'm going to tell you that you did need more than 45 newtons to the right to speed up, to accelerate from 5 to 10. But once you reach that constant velocity, or that, that velocity of 10 newtons per second, that additional pull to the right that you use to accelerate, you're going to reduce it back down to 45 so that you balance your forces out so that your velocity then will remain constant. Will the force required to pull an object on a rougher surface be greater than? Well, it's going to be greater. If you make the surface more rough, you've changed the surfaces that are in contact. Making it more rough will increase the coefficient of friction. If you increase the coefficient of friction, friction will increase. If friction increases, your pull would have to increase in order to match it so that you will be at that constant velocity. So it's going to be greater than a rougher surface will have a greater force friction because coefficient of friction is increased. That means I'll have to pull harder to have a net force of zero. If the object is at rest on a smooth surface, will the force required to make it move from rest be greater than, less than, or equal to 45? Well, we know 45 is the kinetic friction. It was the friction from when it was in motion on the smooth surface. Well, if it's standing still, you'll need more than 45 because static friction is always going to be greater than kinetic friction.
static is always greater than maximum static is always greater than kinetic unless you have a problem where you're only given one and you just use it because that's the information you were given but for the most part when we're making comparisons static is bigger than kinetic so now we have a 30 kilogram block sitting on a rough surface or sitting on a surface maximum force of friction is 150 What's the force of friction acting on the block if I push with a force of 100? So this sounds like they're giving us 150 as the static, the maximum static. So if we push with 100, are we overcoming the static friction? No, we haven't overcome it. And the force of friction is just going to match us. The force of friction will maintain equilibrium. So the forces stay balanced. So you stay at a constant velocity of zero until it's overcome. Did we overcome static friction? No, no we did not. We'd have to push with more than 150 newtons. Since we didn't, static friction is just going to simply match our push or our pull so that we maintain equilibrium, balance forces, and there will be no acceleration, no motion. Then it says, what is the acceleration if I push with 100 newtons? If I push with 100 newtons and I don't overcome static, I'm not going to move. And if I don't move, I've got zero acceleration. C. What's the force of friction acting on the block if I push with a force of 200 newtons? Here, ideally, we would have been given the information where we could calculate kinetic but since all the information we have is the 150, I'm going to recommend we just say that to the left is 150, that kinetic is the same as maximum static. Let's say it's a rounding error. I don't know. We don't have better information to do anything different. So the acceleration would be net force over mass, 200 minus 150 over 30. So 200 minus the opposing 150 gives us 50, 50 over the mass of 30. 50 divided by 30 should be about 1.67 meters per second square. Back page. Find the maximum coefficient of friction necessary to hold a 15 kilogram object against a wall if I push on the object horizontally against the wall with a force of 250. So my force applied is to the left at 250. The mass is 15. So I'm just going to squeeze my arrow here in the margin and say that's my force applied at 250 to the left. It's against the surface of the wall and perpendicular to the surface is the force normal. Force normal is going to keep it balanced at 250 because it's not accelerating into the wall or towards me. Gravity is always down. Mass times gravity is 150. And because the object wants to slide down, friction is acting upwards. Friction always acts in the opposite direction of motion. They want to know the coefficient of friction. So we know friction is equal to coefficient times force normal. Divide force normal to the other side. 150 divided by 250. Should be 0 0.6. is our coefficient of friction. If I push an object of mass 50 kilograms with a force of 200 newtons, 20 seconds, and then we have static and kinetic. First thing we need to do is determine, do we overcome static friction? Let's get our free body diagram going with force of gravity down, force normal up, they're balanced. I'm imagining my objects on the ground or on a surface of some sort, pushing with 200. Now my static friction will be the force normal 500 times the coefficient of static friction, 0 0.39. Let's get our formula in force of friction is coefficient times normal, 0 0.39 times 500. If this value is less than 200. If it's 200 or less, we've overcome static. Let's see what it is. 
195. We're pushing with greater than 195, so we know we've overcome static. Static's gone. Let's cross it out. We'll see what the kinetic is. Force of friction is equal to coefficient times normal. 0 0.34 times 500. Kinetic doesn't respond to an applied force. It doesn't try to maintain equilibrium. So whatever value we get, we use. 170. So opposing our motion is 170 to the left in our free body diagram. They want the acceleration. Acceleration is net force divided by mass. The net force is 200 minus 170 divided by the mass of 50. So 30 over 50. I feel like we just got this number. Acceleration is 0 0.6 meters per second squared. Now it wants to know the velocity of the block after 20 seconds. Well, velocity is not a variable we use in forces, but it was in kinematics. We know the acceleration is 0 0.6. We know the time is 20 seconds. We know the initial velocity was 0, because if I'm going to push something, it's usually not already moving. And we want to know the final velocity. Using Votat, we have V is equal to V0 plus A times T, or V is equal to 0 plus... 0 0.6 times 20. So final velocity will be 12 meters per second. The distance the block travels after 20 seconds, I think it's saying how far does it travel during those 20 seconds. That's how I'm going to respond to it. So we're looking for delta x. We know that acceleration is 0.6. Time is 20. Final velocity, uh, initial velocity is 0. You could use that final velocity, but I don't fully trust it. It came from a calculation, so I'm just going to use the v naught t plus 1 half at squared. <clears throat> v naught t is 0 because v naught is 0, so we have 1 half times 0. 0.6 times 20 squared. And I got about 120 meters. Final question. After 20 seconds, I stop pushing. Find out how long in time. So when I stop at 20 seconds, the box is moving 12 meters per second. So when I let go, it's moving 12. That's the initial velocity. Eventually, it's going to come to a stop. So final velocity is 0. We want to know time. We want to know delta x. And we need to figure out acceleration. We need a third variable. So when I stop pushing it, my force applied is gone. But friction is still there. So I still have the 170 from friction. Mass is still 50. Net force would be the 0 minus 170 over 50. And since acceleration is slowing us down, we know it has to be negative, and that's where it comes from. Negative 3.4, it has to be negative because it's moving to the right, net force is to the left. Plus, if it was positive, it would be speeding up, it'd never go to zero. I'm going to use Votat to get time. V is equal to V0 plus A times T. So V minus V0 divided by A is T. Just subtract a V0 to the other side, then divide both sides by A. I get negative 12 divided by negative 3.4 for my time. You can't have a negative time, so it should be a positive number. 3.53 seconds is the time I got. And if I don't want to use that time just in case there's an error, we could use the v squared is equal to v naught squared plus 2a delta x to solve for delta x. If I subtract v naught squared to the other side, then divide both sides by 2a, I would get v squared minus v naught squared divided by 2a is delta x. 0 squared minus 12 squared over 2 times negative 3.4. Essentially, negative 144 divided by negative 6.8.
21.18 meters is the displacement it takes for it to stop after we stop pushing it.